First of all, uh, welcome to all of you from the NASCOM 10,000 Startups Initiative. And I think most importantly, uh, uh, thank you, Uday, for taking the time to uh, join, us, uh, join us this evening. I, I want to start by uh, thanking Uday and the entire team at uh, uh, Kotak Mahindra Bank for uh, being one of the uh, anchor partners in the 10,000 Startups uh, Initiative. Uh, I think it's great that we have a, non, uh, a company that's in the banking space um, uh, actually as one of the four partners and I think it's a testament to the passion that uh, Uday and his team have for entrepreneurship. Uday, you know, you know we're talking about 10,000 startups. Uh, you were 26 years old, uh, it was 1985 and you created this company uh, with a very focused mission at the point and in the year 2014 as we just start, you've got a 50,000 crore company that you've built, right? So I think we should first give Uday a huge round of applause. And I think it's fair to say, Uday, um, ideally we'll create many more than 10,000 startups in India over tech startups over the next decade. But if we can create 100 companies uh, or even 50 companies like the one that you've created, we've more than achieved, uh, achieved our mission. So let's start off, Uday, with, uh, uh, with, with the early days of your journey. Um, you know, in 85, you created this company around bill discounting. And every few years, you've changed the business, you've added, you've expanded. But tell us a little bit about, you know, you were 26 years old and you started a company in, in India, right? Uh, what was the vision? What, did you, what made you start this company? What was your original vision and goal? Um, uh, thank you, Rajan, and I'm really delighted to be with all of you here. Uh, and let me first start by saying that uh, I've always loved being a startup, which is what I was. And I wish I can keep the spirit of a startup uh, even now at this stage because uh, there is such a great uh, need for every firm to be on the edge in today's world. And I must also admit to something else that if I had started my company today, I had no future because I was able to grow in my early days because of a huge gap in the information society which existed then. And therefore, I would have to think more creatively how I would survive in today. And therefore, friends, uh, I just wanted to share with you the starting point for uh, me uh, in terms of what uh, went in my mind was, hey, here it is. I did my MBA from Bajaj and uh, was al almost joining Hindustan Lever, a consumer product company. When, uh, thanks to a nudge from my father, I started this company. And I had a friend from my Jamnal Al Bajaj MBA class and that highlights the important of, importance of network. And this friend of mine joined a Tata company called Melco. In those days, uh, it was quite strange that banks used to lend money to companies at 17%, which is uh, significantly higher than what they paid on their deposits. And banks would pay individual depositors 6%. That means borrow money from depositors at 6 and lend at 17 and for me, after passing out of MBA and learning all discounted cash flow and all these much higher level hierarchy things, this sounded very strange. I mean, how could you take money at 6 and lend to Tata's at 17? I mean, what is the reason for the 11% spread? But in that was the opportunity and uh, it was the early seeds of what you call as a banking business in a way. So I went uh, to a lot of my family friends. Uh, who used to keep money in bank deposits at 6% and say, listen, instead of 6, what if you got 12% on a Tata company risk? You're not taking risk on me, but on a Tata company risk. I'll give you 12. So they would look at me strangely and say, does this guy know what he's talking? But maybe we'll put in a lakh or two lakhs into bill discounting. So I got money at 12. And I went to Nelco and said, okay, 17 is what you're getting from your banks, but if there was a scarcity, banks did not give unlimited money, I will do it at 16. So a spread which was 11% between 6 and 17, I narrowed it to 4%. And that's how business happened to me. I worry about it if today's world, in today's world, if there was a 400 basis point spread, social media or whatever other technology would wipe it out in uh, minutes. But it, that's how it remained and that's how we grew in the early days. And it is quite amazing that uh, the Indian banking system is what it is. And even today, it is 
there are lots of areas where banking is still very much behind the curve and i see that as a huge huge opportunity and also for a number of entrepreneurs to leverage of the banking industry and its inefficiencies for building business models that's great so so we'll come to the white space opportunities uday so i think it's very interesting right what you said was there was this glaring opportunity around arbitrage yeah you know um, and i think in in with 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 startups one of the things we talk a lot about is you know are you going after a real unmet or you know opportunity yeah. right because a lot of you know we do see a lot of companies that are trying to build a, a feature yeah. you know it's a small thing but you were going after this massive thing yeah. given where india was to to do that so that's great so now let's let's go to the first few years i think what uh, i think many of the 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 attendees are are building companies they're in their early stages of building companies and i think entrepreneurs as you know struggle with getting through the first three or four years yeah. so if you can get through those first few years then it becomes easier i mean some could argue it gets harder but but to, tell us you know what were the three or four most important things in the first let's say three or four years of your journey as an entrepreneur yeah i think uh, i i the, the thing which you really got to focus is whatever is the need for business you should be able to spend money for that and whatever is outside just don't waste money and therefore i could not afford a fancy office so in flora fountain my family gave me 300 square feet of office space which was compound tiles and old furniture we actually i remember godrej tables we had we cut the tables into smaller size so that we had more space and more people to accommodate so for anything which is a wasteful overhead and which is not adding to your business or your top line don't waste money but anything which is critical for your business don't save money and therefore i used to do business in chennai with a leasing company and which meant i needed to travel to chennai i the cost of air travel plus hotel stay at hotel konemara in those days was a lot of money i could not afford to stay in a lower level hotel because the guy i was meeting he should feel that this guy is okay so i had to stay in a hotel like uh, hotel konemara but it was pressure for me on overhead but you did it because that was needed for your business therefore don't cringe on anything which helps you build your business everything else is a waste of money and just be very tight and ruthless about it and don't be ashamed about what people will say are aap godown jaisi jagah se kaam kar rahe ho doesn't matter as long as you have a business model perfect so so what about the uh, you know and i think that's very helpful because because in the early days of a startup funding is very scarce yeah. i think some startups don't spend on what they need to spend and yeah. i think your example is terrific what about building the team with you were 26 years old um how did you build a team in the early days i mean who did you hire how did you get them to join you yeah one of the first people uh, i got to join me was a person who was in the finance department at nelco the guy was very smart in terms of squeezing me on rates and everything else and i just found him to be an outstanding negotiator in those so i started with myself and two people which who were junior people but when i found this guy to be so good uh i wooed him i went after him and he was also a bit of a startup kind of guy a guy called shivaji dam uh a chartered accountant and he joined me from nelco so that was my first break and thereafter i found that you had to make sure that you were getting people with high integrity but smart on the other side of the counterpart defense and if you spotted one go after that person and that's how i built the team so and how did you get people to you know one of the things i think uh, even entrepreneurs even today struggle with is how do you get that absolute best talent to take the risk and join their startup right and how did you think about it in those i days? think it it is a little bit of passion it's a little bit of purpose it's a little bit of something different uh, something challenging and a lot of it is personal charisma in the early stages i mean you have to be able to convince the other side with your passion and purpose that hey we will create something right and that it has to be believable and that's absolutely important yeah so you are the chief hiring officer absolutely chief of era yeah terrific um you know let's go to the next question you know startups you know in the in the entrepreneurial land these days we have this word called pivot mm-hmm. you know you got to change the business you got to adjust to the market landscape etc um you know if you look at the company you built kotak you pretty much not just survived but thrived through every crisis you know whether it's the 91 crisis the harshad mehta scam the asian crisis the dot com bust the recent global meltdown 
uh, you you know I think your firm not only just went through those but became stronger at each phase. It'll be helpful for you to share some lessons of you know how are you able to do that? I mean you know most of your contemporaries may have disappeared. You know logos keep going away through each of these scams, but you all got stronger. You added more businesses. Tell us a little bit about that. I think uh, every crisis in a sector is a huge opportunity, and we have found post every single crisis we have benefited and the reasons for them are two number one is your ability to spot a problem before others do and number two is to make sure that in general you make less mistakes than everybody else and 1991 92 was a sarshad mehta security scam it was waiting to happen and i have seen huge deaths of my competition and we lived through what i call as the agni pariksha and there are a few uh, home truths which we have now internalized in the firm one of them is when something is too good to be true it is too good to be true so <laughs> don't challenge it and very often people get sucked in by some lure of something which is too good to be true so there will always be a catch there watch out for that number 2 you need to be able to think little beyond and be able to say that you know for example in 97 98 when you saw the asian crisis lot of nbfcs in the sector which i was died um, there were some 4000 odd nbfcs and 3980 died and the mortality rate was huge it was it took up took away a lot of competition we said that unlike the big banks in those days the state owned banks and some of the private sector banks we will we will not get any bailout from anybody to give capital to us but we go to survive on our own we actually pruned our lending book by 50% okay our stock collapsed but we knew we were on the right track and that saved us so in that period 97 98 2003 is when the whole industry got wiped out we actually came out of it much stronger but markets too did not see it till two or three years later and the other interesting aspect is be very clear what you know and what you don't so in the mid 90s we felt that in the financial sector we did not know what the hell was happening enough we were a little bit like frogs in the well so we did joint venture tie ups with two global majors goldman sachs and ford credit one is in investment banking and securities others in car finance and we learned from them we imbibe the best practices so more than the financial capital knowledge capital which came from them was something which was very wide and 10 years later we bought back our stake whatever we had given them in both those joint ventures and in a very happy manner so we have great relationships with all our partners but we think knowledge and knowing how best global practices are is critical for scaling perfect so i think those are those are very good lessons i think making sure you're always trying to look at the future understand the risks making sure you yeah. surround yourself with partners team members who bring new capabilities yeah. and so on and so forth right and also one of the interesting things that you mentioned today which is you took a hard call and you cut your portfolio yeah. in half yes right and the stock market reacted so being able to make those calls at the right time without worrying about quarter, otherwise you would have gone under right? yeah and without worrying about quarter to quarter what is the point um let's now move to uh, adoption of uh, of technology in the banking in in your firm but also in the banking sector uh you know in many ways what's happened in india today is you know we've gone from having no internet users now having 200 million internet users 70 million of them access of the internet through smartphones and so on and so forth the banking sector has rolled out atm technology very well and i think a few banks like yours now beginning to adopt you know good you know website have good website now have good mobile strategies etc uh, talk to us a little bit about you know given where you are where do you think the internet mobile internet and technology more broadly whether it's you know aadhar and other other platforms what can it really do to the banking industry over the next 5 10 years you know uh, fra- frankly rajan i think uh, banking industry is light years behind what's happening in the broader technology i try to say that in a nice way yeah and uh we had rajan come and spend uh, half a day with us uh, i think a few months ago and it is just shocking how much behind the curve banks are but in that lies the opportunity for every one of you that because we are behind the curve we will be forced to adopt 
good new things which can be fitted in like a plug into what we are doing. And there's a huge, huge opportunity for efficiency in banking. The problem which, uh, and I think some of it is genuine and some of it is uh, in our minds, is the perception about risk and trust. And I think central banks also are slow for that same reason. How risky is it and how trustworthy is the basis of the new technology from the point of view of uh, robustness. And we spend an enormous amount of time trying to save ourselves from numerous frauds which are hitting our industry coming out of this whole technology. Therefore, one big area which I think uh, banking industry would love to grab is around security. Or if we can get a lot of technology and applications around security to make you more secure, which we are very, 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 very nervous about that. I mean, what is it that keeps me awake every night? Will I have a bank next morning? Will the bank be cleaned out? That is one. On the other hand, so that is the security aspect. On the other hand, what keeps me awake is uh, why do you need this so-called animal collar bank? Tomorrow, a Google or a Vodafone or an AT&T can do everything we do. Will we have a business five or ten years from now? So it is these two extreme sort of things which are actually the, the whole canvas of opportunity from the point of view of where banking is, where it can be, but what are the risks? So that, that's, very, that's very interesting, uh, Uday. You know, you mentioned that... Uh, Areas like security are, you know, clearly yeah. huge yeah. areas of concern and also opportunities for startups. But I think uh, what you'll hear from a lot of entrepreneurs here is, you know, when, you, when, you, when you're a technology startup and you make your list of vertical markets to go after, mm -hmm. banking is not on the top 10. Yep. Because, you know, it's very difficult to convince banks and CIOs. They'd much rather work with an IBM or a TCS. What counsel do you have for entrepreneurs who are building technology companies, trying to, you know, make banks their banks or you know, the BFSI segment customers, what counsel would you have for them? Because as a small company, you know, it's hard to convince a CIO or a... Yeah, I think in banks, we have also faced the other side of the problem, is that when we've dealt with some companies which are relatively younger companies, after we've got them on board and actually trusted them with some areas of our applications, we found some of them have problems, people leave, uh, the stability of the counterparty is a big concern for us. Therefore. Maybe in the early stages for a startup, you need to reach a certain level of stability before banks will be comfortable to really deal directly. Therefore, if it comes along with a more stable name, right. it makes it easier for us. But for us, we need, we, we, we are hungry and we were pretty keen on finding new ways of keeping our uh, edge as a product. And I think the problem which I find in banking is that I mean, most banks have become too much meat. We really need to think about how we differentiate ourselves. And I think differentiation is through smarter, better, efficient service. And what can we do for that? Terrific. Now, one of the, you know, you mentioned security as one area. Another area that I think there's a lot of excitement in the banking space, but also among startups is payments. Mm -hmm. um, would love to hear your thoughts on what are the two or three big opportunities that you see in payments in India where, let's say, set of smart entrepreneurs could go build a billion dollar business. Yeah. I think one big area which I think is relatively underserved is the whole area of check, check temptation. Uh, the RBI has now allowed banks to uh, not present uh, physical checks uh, to clearing but move to a whole check temptation system. Uh, it's dramatically changing the world of physical checks. So if uh, there can be, uh, I mean, uh, if you look at the US today, you can, a customer can directly take a photograph of a check right. and it gets cleared. I don't think India is no, still no. not there. So I think the whole area of CTS, I think is a very significant opportunity for people to be thinking about. There has been some discussion about mobile wallets. I don't think they've really so far reached the, op uh, the potential they can. And one of the issues in India, which I think we've got to keep in mind is that it's a very large cash economy. Therefore, a lot of people continue to want to sort of settle in cash, which has also limited the use of credit cards. But I think the whole area of cards again, and what can be done with it, either through cards or some other payment forms, uh, could be a big opportunity for the future. And there again, I think this uh, 
two stage verification which has now been introduced is again a pretty uh, uh, burden something for customers but that's the trade off between convenience and security so i do believe while payments is going to be a very important thing rajan as we discussed a little while ago the increased cash economy is a problem for smooth payments growth and i would strongly encourage nascom to see how you can take up and this is a much broader political social civil society and economic issue why does the economy keep on having such a large portion of it in cash so actually so one of the things uh, and this is interest might be interesting for the entrepreneurs building payments or other startups in the is one of the things they mentioned is compared to 1985 to today the yeah. percentage of cash economy has increased we might want to talk a little bit about yeah. that so I, i was quite surprised i thought it's coming down i think the contrary you know you would have assumed that uh, with uh, liberalization and reform the cash economy would actually come down the fact of the matter is the cash economy in india not only has not come down it has grown significantly more and a cash economy it distorts the formal transparent payments system i keep on asking myself why do we need to keep on having so many branches because ideally in a net and online world we would not need as many branches one of the reasons is because small businesses across the country have disproportionate cash and we see it the majority of transactions in our branches are handling cash so one of the things which is vital for a speedier growth of the payment system is a shrinkage of the distorted non transparent cash economy which has significantly grown uh, in india in the last 20 25 years and why 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 is it that there is so i mean why is it that credit cards have not grown faster it's because people want to use their informal money and pay in cash and if you look at the model of flipkart cash on delivery the reason is a lot of customers want to use cash rather than pay on card so it's a complicated uh, thing and therefore from the point of view of transparency i think less cash in the economy is critical for the future and for some of you who know banking a little better the uh, current account balances with banks uh, banks pay zero interest that precisely because the cost of handling cash is high and therefore it is a way for compensating banks for inefficient handling of cash so current account balances interest is zero yeah so is there an opportunity there much like what you had in 85 i mean but this is by law the oh, regular <laughs> So why why is it zero? I think the but that is that is uh, one of the reasons is there's a huge cash handling cost. The right. bank is a branch cost, the rental of a branch. Right. Who pays for it? Right. So the reason that I mean not it's not the only reason but it's I one of the important yeah. that the one of the primary reasons for a branch is actually all this cash. Exactly. It's not the customer service, not the acquisition. I mean those are part of it but part of it of course if you know customer likes to see a bank branch next to his home or office I mean that's there's a psychological need. Yeah. all those factors are there and continue to be there but in addition to that the simple handling of the cash can is important so 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 they now let's let's um, uh, uh, i've just got a few more questions and then we'll get our startups up here if you were 25 again today you know 2014 india you know obviously economy 1.8 trillion second largest internet market in the world what would you, you know and you said you're going to do a startup Yeah. What would you do? What are the three kind of companies you build? Uh, I think that's a real tough one, but uh, I, I, I would probably use technology for sure. I think most likely it will be around mobile because I think that's extremely powerful. And I would find a massive national distribution disintermediation business, which is so. Say more about that because I don't yeah. know what that. Yeah, I think if you really look at it, the gap. Uh, in terms of the whole distribution system between urban and rural india is huge and if i can find a way of efficiently being able to handle ticket sizes which are smaller it is it is uh, something like what hindustan lever did with sashes build a distribution model which is low cost so the cost to serve is pretty low like what technology what uh, telecom companies have done right. in terms of mobile rates for you mean for for, for financial services for financial services right and find a technology driven solution to low cost national distribution and use that for disintermediating the banks because frankly uh, the banking system has a significant counter opportunity 
from startups to disintermediate. And and to do that, would you need a banking license or you wouldn't? In my view, you could do through an NBFC platform. Right. The question really is, of course, it's about regulation, it's about broadband, it's about uh, how effective internet is. But if somebody got that, it can dramatically shrink intermediation costs. That's it. And, and you haven't seen anybody doing that yet in India. I think part of the problem is also the whole broadband and the net and the uh, how good that service is and how sort of robust that is. So if you get high class broadband across the country, I think you'll see that. Got it. Terrific. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about, I think, things you've learned, uh, what's worked, what's not worked, your, few, you know, your perspectives on white space. Talk a little bit about, you know, some of the mistakes you've made as a, in the early days, not, not today, but... You know, if you were to do it again, building a company, building teams, um, what are some of the things you learned uh, that might be helpful for the audience here? Ah, I think I've made a lot of mistakes all along the way. Uh, frankly, uh, I, I asked myself the question, especially after we became a bank in 2003, should we have scaled up faster? And should we have taken big bets on scaling up faster than we have? And in retrospect, if I had the opportunity I would have scaled up between 2003 and 2008 even faster than even faster even faster than we had and uh, maybe I, sh I I had the opportunity of being 2 or 3x where we are and it's at that time you're beginning to worry oh if I spend so much and invest so much uh, it's going to hurt my uh, p and I'm not sure about the outcomes but the opportunity was extremely large and therefore little uh, bolder than uh, would have certainly helped. And uh, therefore, for this New Year's, my message to my employees uh, was, we are going to build a bigger, better, bolder Kotak. So there you go. Terrific. Terrific. That's great. Um, you know, one of the things we talked about outside uh, there was, you know, despite being in a $1.8 trillion economy where the ecosystem has developed, you have a couple of hundred angel investors, a lot of VCs, the reality is raising 50 lakhs. It's still very, very difficult, right? I'm sure there are entrepreneurs in the room where, you know, run around for six months, talk to all kinds of, you know, investors to raise 50 lakhs. Um, you know, you come at it from a financial services standpoint, right? Yeah. What, what advice do you have for the ecosystem? And this is more really for the ecosystem on how we can solve, because it's a shame to have so yeah. many great ideas, founders, and raising 50 lakhs really hard. Rajan, I told you about it. Uh, two Rajans together can make a big difference. One is you and second is Governor Rajan. And, and uh, maybe you should go and talk to uh, the other Rajan about how, uh, you know, we as a bank, all banks have requirements of 40% priority sector. Is it possible to consider angel funding or venture funding as a part of a priority sector, as a part of the inclusion exercise, where banks put in an X amount of money into some sort of a fund right, and see how there could be a pretty dramatic uh, growth for uh, putting capital for startups. The question in my mind is, do we have the investors, I mean, when I, when I, the investment capability right. and those smart investment managers like you have on, in the Valley in the US, who can really understand how to take the bets on startups. And if we have some really good managers who can do this, I think money can come. I think it's a great idea for those of you, you know, hopefully you got that, which is to say, you know, how do you make risk capital for startups? Yeah. Part of a priority sector so that a lot more money flows from the banks yeah. into funds and investors and so on and so forth. And I think the, uh, the, the policy makers have to differentiate between private equity and angel investing. That's right. And this is much more angel and uh, even early stage venture. So you really need to figure out how that is given uh, a special treatment as distinct from growth private equity. Right, absolutely. You know, the, 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 just one more question and then we'll get our startups up here. Um, you know, have you had mentors as you've built the company, um, Uday, and if you're comfortable saying who they are, that's great, but if otherwise would love to talk, you know, just give, give us some thoughts around the importance of mentors, having a network, and so on. I think network is critical and uh, being able to listen to people is extremely important. But for me, a lot of my uh, early stage uh, experience came from a professor uh, at Jamnalal Bajaj, and I have no hesitation in publicly 
saying it is a professor called professor mankekar he was uh, uh, our finance corporate finance uh, uh, professor and the first day at class he said uh, what is the most important thing for a company so people answered this that most of it is around profits okay and he said no and the answer is something which each of you will relate to he said cash flow do you have enough money in your bank every, or in your company to be able to do what you need to do and around that of course uh, what i i was very fascinated by him and as a from bajaj professor mankekar used to be a pretty significant investor in stock markets and this is in 1981 i would literally hold his little finger and go with him to the stock exchange and look at how the uh, the whole theory of finance was being implemented by him in investing so that was early stage great learning for me and uh, even today he's one of the most outstanding uh, public market investors uh, personally so i my my view is rather than have one role model you look at learn from different people get the best and try and create your own uh, chemis- uh, chemical uh, mix out of that perfect no i think that's fantastic and i think also for the technology industry this notion that cash is king yeah because we like to invest cash not generate cash so i think that's one thing we can learn from and rajan that's what i told you i have grown up with a fundamental view that cash flow is extremely important what i understand in your industry what is extremely important is cash burn therefore if you burn more cash you're more valuable but i i can't figure that out yeah <laughs> only eventually if you're going to generate lots of cash <laughs> and that is the that is the art of storytelling and uh, technology company building so let's uh, uh, let's give uday a big round of applause everyone thank you uday for that thank you.